Welcome, bienvenue, and welcome back to many of you. My name is Alana Block. I'm a doctor of naturopathic medicine, and I practice here in Montreal. I'd like to just take a moment to discuss the difference between homeopathy and naturopathy, because I get this question all the time. What's the difference between homeopathy and naturopathy? So homeopathy is its own system of medicine. It's practiced by many naturopathic doctors, by some medical doctors, and others, whereas homeopaths are trained exclusively in homeopathy. Naturopathic medicine is a profession that encompasses many different systems of medicine, which can include homeopathy as well. So this is the second of a two-part debate. The first debate was in May on the regulation of naturopathic medicine, and this one is on homeopathy. I'll ask you to all please turn off your cell phones. That'd be great. Um, I've passed index cards and pencils around, and there are there are a few sitting around everywhere if anyone's missing one. If you have any questions, if you could please write the question down on the index card and pass it to the aisle. And between the debate segments, we'll be walking through the aisles and collecting the questions. So please just write the question down, pass it to the aisle. That would be great. So I'll introduce Dr. Mark Ware, who will be our fantastic moderator for the evening. He did such an amazing job in May. We're really happy to have him back. Dr. Mark Ware is Associate Professor in Family Medicine and Anesthesia at McGill University and is Director of Clinical Research of the Allen Edwards Pain Management Unit of the McGill University Health Center. We hope you enjoy the evening. Have a good one, and I'll hand you over to Dr. Ware. Thank you, Alana. Uh, it's a pleasure to see so many people here tonight, and as a, uh, as a clinician practicing in a chronic pain management clinic, we get approached a, a lot by patients who come and their families asking about different kinds of treatments for different kinds of pain. Uh, very often they've done their own searches, you can go on the internet and look for chronic pain, and there are a tremendous number of therapies that are advertised or abdicated or which people to share with one another. Uh, naturopathic medicine and approaches, uh, alternative and complementary approaches are very commonly used. In fact, it's one of the most common reasons why people use alternative and complementary medicine is the treatment of chronic pain. So I'm well aware of the, of the public interest. And I, just as a, a show of hands, I know that uh, Dr. Schwartz's course was being held here. Can I just have a show of hands? How many of you are McGill students or students in science? So that's about half, maybe a bit more of the room. How many general public members here for interest? Oh, sort of pretty evenly mixed. We've got about uh, maybe I would say 40% public, 60% science. Um, so thank you for coming and, uh, and sharing your interest uh, for, 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 for this topic. Um, I'm going to set a little bit of the, uh, the ground rules here. Uh, the first thing to tell you is how the debate's going to perform, uh, is how the debate is going to be uh, handled. This isn't really a debate in the classical sense, in that we have a motion and that you'll be asked to vote on at the end, and there's a winner and a loser. In this debate, everybody wins. Um, and essentially, the topic that we're, is faced before us is, is homeopathy, mere placebo, or great medicine. And I can tell you that the only time I've ever been sworn at at a scientific conference was when I mentioned homeopathy. Uh, so you can imagine that this engenders pretty strong emotions. And as a result of that, I'm going to ask you all to be pleased on your best behavior. You may hear things said by one or the other of our speakers that you disagree with, uh, that you do agree with. Please keep your comments and mumbles and moans and boos and hisses to a minimum to allow our presenters and our speakers to do their best in presenting you their opinions and their judgments. Uh, having said that, you will have an opportunity to ask questions. And in the past, in some public sessions we've had, people, when offered the chance to give a question, can often go on a little bit longer than we might like. So we've given you the index card option, and they will be collected, and I'll be going through them and picking out representative questions. So several questions will come up several times, so in, in order to avoid repetition, I'll pick an example of the kinds of question that's being asked. And an example of just how engaging this topic is, I actually had a question emailed to me yesterday by somebody who couldn't come and said, please ask this question. So people have already begun asking questions uh, even before the debate has begun. So the way it's going to work is uh, Andre, uh, our first speaker, will present for 30 minutes. 
Uh, that will be countered by Dr. Joe Schwartz, who will speak for 30 minutes. They will then each have 10 minutes to rebut the other's arguments. Then they will have a question and answer session between them, and at that point, we'll open this floor to you for questions. And at the very end, they'll have a chance for a two-minute summary, and uh, I'll hopefully conclude the session, and we'll all be ready to go home by 9 o'clock. I appreciate that it's a long session. It will be engaging. Like somebody asked me this evening when they heard about it, they asked me if there were going to be fireworks. I can't promise you fireworks. I can promise you engaging discussions. I can promise you a lot of very interesting uh, material and uh, two very interesting speakers who I will introduce you briefly now before they begin. Uh, Dr. Andre Sen is the uh, president of the Quebec Association of Naturopathic Medicine. He's also a practicing naturopathic doctor who specializes in homeopathy. Please welcome Andre Sen. And Professor Joe Schwartz is Professor of Chemistry here at McGill University. He's the Director of the Office of Science and Society, uh, the author of many books. The most recent one is called The Right Chemistry, available at a bookstore near you. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Joe Schwartz, known to most of you as Dr. Joe. And without further ado, I'm going to invite our speakers. I will be the timekeeper. I broke my arm recently playing hockey, so I'm committed to a cause. If somebody goes on too long, I will charge the stage and ram you with my cast. So please respect the time frame. Um, and please respect each other. I ask for a, a, an, an air of, of respect from the audience, and I expect also the same from my two uh, debaters. Uh, if there are fisticuffs looming, I will also step in and interrupt. Um, and there is a reason for making those statements, as I'm sure you will experience. And we're going to ask Andre Sen to open the floor, please, 30 minutes on homeopathy, mere placebo or great medicine. Good evening. I'd like to dedicate this uh, hysteric debate to Samuel Hahnemann, the founder of homeopathy, who 200 years ago, exactly in the fall of 2012, uh, began teaching homeopathy at the University of Leipzig. Also, I'd like to dedicate this debate to his most brilliant student, Adolf Lippe, who uh, we're celebrating this year's his 200th birth anniversary. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight we're asked to debate a question that has been harshly argued over for more than 200 years. And for more than 200 years, the position on either side have been in a, stuck in a complete deadlock. It's just astonishing to note that the argument on either side have essentially not changed over this long period of time. On one side, you have, <coughs> on one side you have skeptics who, from a mere theoretical point of view, argue that homeopathy is impossible. Therefore, it can't work. And any evidence in favor of homeopathy is logically flawed, is looked as completely flawed. Now, this position has led to, not surprisingly, to harsh criticism, such as homeopathy is a pernicious quack, uh, quackery, or that the tenets of homeopathy are marinated in pseudoscience. And it has led, unfortunately, to intolerance, such as homeopathy is ethically unacceptable and ought to be actively rejected by healthcare professionals. and has called for the end of homeopathy and the end of veterinary homeopathy. On the other side of the conflict, we have generation after generation of homeopaths all over the world claiming from a purely factual point of view with loads of evidence, and yet it works. And will denounce any trial showing that homeopathy is not better than placebo as being fundamentally flawed. Homeopathy, since Adamant, 
have insistently, omipath, sorry, since Ahneman have insistently deplored the fact that skeptic have not studied homeopathy sufficiently to be able to conduct trials or simply to be able to criti criticize homeopathy fairly. As a fragrant example of this, Sheng and all published a meta-analysis in The Lancet in 2005. They reported having analyzed eight trials of homeopathy. One of the major flaws contained in this meta-analysis is that six of the eight trials were absolutely not testing homeopathy, but poor imitation of it. Absolutely fundamental to the practice of homeopathy is the individualized single remedy. Prescribe uh, on the totality of the symptom of the patient in a dosage that is also individualized. Of the eight trials of homeopathy in the Shang and meta-analysis, there were two trials testing, uh, uh, testing individualized treatment with these two, with the single remedy, but not with the individualized dosage. Uh, as for the six other trial, none of them were individualized. This is, unfortunately, very bad science. Because, before going any further, it is very important to understand that Hahnemann was a man of science. He was recognized at this time as a great scientist and particularly an expert chemist. Hahnemann was born and, and, and educated in the, in the years of uh, the time of enlightenment in Europe, which was the time of rationality. And he tried to bring rationality in medicine. And he endeavored to do this all his life. And therefore, he did his first uh, uh, edition of the Organon. Organon means the instrument of understanding. was called the Organon of the Rational healing art, art of healing, rational healing art. So this was in 1810. Hahnemann must be remembered for the extreme rigor he applied to all his scientific investigation, which he requested nothing less from his critics. In 1817, he wrote a most important note to, to his reviewer. Yeah, he wrote a most important note to his reviewer in which he said, homeopathy appeals not chiefly, but solely to the verdict of experience. Repeat the experiment, it cries aloud, but repeat them carefully and accurately, and you will find these observation, not theories, these observation confirm at every step, insisting upon being judged by the results. In other words, Anwan Arneman makes, the f makes more than the fair request that anyone who intends to make a trial of homeopathy or wants to make a critical criticism of it needs absolutely to obtain a minimal of competence in the principle and practice of homeopathy, which as a rule takes a minimum of two years of study. Now to the big question of the evening. Who's right, who's wrong in this conflict about homeopathy being mere placebo or great medicine? This is of great interest to the skeptics who believe that people are being fooled, wasting their money on useless treatment, which can potentially be harmful as what they believe can, be, can delay more effective treatment. On the other side, we have homeopaths who, for, from first-hand daily experience of immense, uh, uh, the immense, the experience, the immense health benefit brought by homeopathy, or advocating that every single person has the most fundamental right to have full access to this uniquely gentle, safe, effective, and curative system of medicine. I believe this long-lasting and complete deadlock on a purely scientific question is, at minimum, bizarre, and certainly unique in the history of modern science. And it can only be resolved by proceeding with nothing less than with the greatest scientific rigor every step of the way. Science in general, 
and homeopathy in particular requires critical thinking, but at the same time, openness of the mind all the way. Scientists must be interested by phenomena and be prepared for new discovery and changing paradigms. Let's now address, no, tonight, I invite you all to approach a question before us with a, with a complete non-biased mind and use the best scientific thinking to make sense of this schism that has divided the medical profession so unfortunately for suffer, suffering humanity. Let's now, let me now address the skeptic arguments of implausibility. The argument of implausibility particularly one, uh, uh, focus particularly on one aspect of homeopathy, which is the fact that homeopaths use ultra-molecular preparation. <clears throat> ultra-molecular preparation, UMPS, so I'll use this this evening, UMPS, just be aware of it's ultra-molecular preparation, are prepared from solution that went through a process of serial succussion and dilution, usually exceeding in theory, avocado's net limit. The use of UMPS has certainly been the biggest stumbling block for the acceptance of homeopathy in scientific quarters. Indeed, skeptics commonly assume, first, that there is not a single molecule of the original substance in homeopathic remedy. And second, homeopathic remedy are indistinguishable from each other. Maybe skeptics are right on the first point, that there's no single molecule on the, of the original substance in UMPs. However, on the second statement, namely that UMPs are indistinguishable from each other, they are wrong according to current scientific data. Indeed, we find a two, uh, 2003 paper published in Physica A in which ultra uh, ultra high dilution of lithium chloride and sodium chloride 10 minus 30 have been irradiated by x-ray and gamma rays. It was found that despite the dilution beyond the avocado's number, the emitted light was specific to the original salt dissolved initially. More so, in a 2008 paper by the team of Rustam Roy, Professor Emeritus of Material Science at Penn State University, which is this, their signature lab, confirm that it is possible not only to distinguish one UMPS from another, but also one PONC from another, with two different types of spectroscopy. The results show that such materials can be easily distinguished from the pure solvent and from each other. Spectra show clear difference between two different remedy and different potency on the same remedy. Now, different labs and different with different take. Oh, all those can. This is a nice quote. This opened up a whole new field of endeavor for inorganic material scientists interested in biological effect. We find. We find also. Uh, other teams of researchers with other forms of spectroscopy also investigating the same phenomena and they're finding the same thing. Here it's, uh, they, they find out that the, the change in the water is permanent. And uh, the, uh, they say the nature of the phenomena here described still remain unexplained. Nevertheless, some significant uh, experimental results were obtained. This was published in the Journal of Thermal Analysis and Calorimetry. Now, the, regarding the, uh, how durable it is, there's other researcher, like a skeptic will say that it can, these change in the water can last only nanoseconds. However, researchers from, uh, uh, again, the same team of researcher here, they investigate the age, how long does the change in the water last? And they find out that this change multiply with time. And they find, they, they, con they find out the increasing pattern does not seem to depend on the degree of dilution or on the, the nature of the initial substance. The, the, the excess conductivity of all systems increase with a gentle slope, reaching a maximum 
in some case, very pronounced at the age of 500 days. You see the days there, and the, the, the properties augment with time. Coming back to the first argument, homeopaths, of course, have to admit there's not a single molecule. Well, let's look at this. A paper that was published in 2010 from uh, the Indian Institute of Technology, which is, 40, is ranked 49 in the world in, in terms of School of Engineering compared to 46 on the QS scale of un top university. So not too far from McGill, 46th place. And they, uh, they found out that uh, we demonstrated for the first time by transmission electron microscopy the presence of physical entity in these extreme dilution in the form of nanoparticles of the starting metal and the aggregate. And here you can see on the, on the left, you can see thin at the uh, 10 minus 60. And on the right, you can see thin at the 10 minus 400. Now, uh, you will say, yeah, but that was published in the Journal of Homeopathy. The same team published in the Journal of Langmuir, which is a very, very prestigious uh, journal of, uh, of chemistry. Actually, it's the, one of the journals of the American Chemical Society. And uh, they have a, a, a motto, which is, let me see the motto, which is uh, the most trusted, the most cited, and the most read journal. And this team from India, from the Indian Institute of uh, Technology, they, they confirmed that they, they found particle even in these extreme super uh, avocado dilution. And they found out a process. I'll just show you. So here is the process of trituration. And here is the process of, uh, of dilution. After, after uh, three sets of uh, three series of uh, trituration, it goes into a solution, and then there's succus. And as this process pro uh, progress, uh, there's uh, uh, nanobubbles that accumulate in an asymptotic uh, manner. That means it never reaches zero. So, as you're uh, diluting and succussing, it actually multiplies, the nanobubbles multiply. And they concluded, our conclusion arises from our experiment indicating that in a successive dilution process of manufacturing beyond a certain stage, the dilution is merely apparent, and the concentration of starting material in the diluted product reach a non-zero asymptotic uh, no matter level, no matter how much more the, the sample is diluted. It is hard to understand how skeptics still maintain that all this research represents a plundering, a plundering of science. This statement is contrary to current scientific research which support the biological plausibility of UMPS. In a 2005 paper in Material Research Innovation entitled The Structure of Liquid Water, Novel insight from material research, potential relevance to homeopathy, we can read. This paper definitively demolished the objections against homeopathy. And I will skip the rest of the quotes there. In a summary, or a review of the literature on the plausibility of homeopathic simulation published in 2011, the author that reviewed the literature conclude, in conclusion, our work and that of many other researchers suggests that homeopathy is not only plausible, but constitutes one of the frontier of medical science and more specifically of complexity science, biophysics, and nanopharmacology. For these reasons, the tenet according to which homeopathy is based on the principle that are incompatible with well-established science cannot be accepted. An investigation of homeopathic treatment appears to be warranted and ethically justifiable. Now, the question that we probably all have, fine, we have remedy that makes sense. There is nanoparticles. There is change, a permanent change in the solution. But can they have a physiological effect? 
Skeptic already concluded, no. Let's look at the science. Let's look at the research. Effects, uh, evidence of the clinical effectiveness of homeopathy. First, we're going to look at in vitro research. We can read in this 2007 systematic review of the in vitro research in homeopathy. A systematic assessment of the in vitro research on eye potency effects. That was their objective. Inclusion criteria, stepwise agitated dilution, smaller than 10 minus 23, cells or molecules from human or animal. Results from 75 publications, 67 experiment, one third of them replication, were evaluated. Nearly three quarters of them found a high potency effect. Nearly three quarters of all replication were positive. Conclusion. Experiment with a high methodological standard demonstrate an effect of high potencies. Let's look at plant research now. Here again, we have, we have a 2009 critical review of uh, the literature on plant, um, plant uh, research in homeopathy. The literature on the application of homeopathy for controlling plant disease in both plant pathological model and field trial was reviewed. Results, a total of 44 publications on phytopathological models were identified. 19 papers were statistics. In general, significant and reproducible effect with decimal and centesimal potencies were found, including dilution level beyond Avocado's number. The next question that needs to be answered is whether homeopathy really works clinically. That's what we are here for. So let's look whether it works. First, let's look at veterinary research. We have, these are randomized controlled trials with positive evidence. Here you have infertility in cattle, mastitis in cattle, infectious disease in pig, and so on, and so on. And here we have clinical outcome studies with positive evidence with kennel cough in dogs, epilepsy in dogs, Cushing syndrome, and so on. Now let's look at observational studies. Observational studies provide variable information that is complementary to the results of clinical trials. And here, it is particularly helpful to evaluate real life outcome over many years. First, this 2005 review paper entitled Research on Homeopathy, State of the Art, in which it is stated, Observational research of homeopathy of homeopathic practice documents consistently strong therapeutic effect and sustained satisfaction in patient. Historically, homeopaths were among the first to introduce double-blinded experiment in human subject. Now let's look at two large-scale prospective observational studies over many years. The first one is out of the UK, in which the author reports, this was an observational study of 6,500 consecutive follow-up patients during a six-year period. Results, homeopathic intervention offered positive air change, health change to a substantial proportion, 71%. The second study I'm gonna show comes from Germany and Switzerland was published in 2008, and the author report, in a prospective multi-center cohort study with 103 homeopathic primary care practices in Germany and Switzerland, data from all patients older than one year old consulting the physician for the first time were observed. Results, a total of 3,700 patients were studied, 73% contribute data to the eight-year follow-up. Disease severity decreased significantly, triple zero one, p-value of triple zero one is extraordinary. One chance in a thousand it could have happened between baseline two and eight years. Physical and mental quality of life score also increased considerably. Conclusion, patients who seek homeopathic treatment are likely to improve significantly these effects last for as long as eight years. 
Now let's look at therapeutic trials. There are all kinds of wonderful trials uh, uh, throughout the long history of homeopathy. However, I will focus on two uh, RCT, two randomized controlled trials. The first one we're going to look is uh, the outcome is very interesting because the outcome is life or death. So that's a bit more dramatic. This is a study on sepsis in intensive care unit. Mortality in patients with severe sepsis remain high despite the development of several therapeutic strategies. The incidence of severe sepsis is between 70 to 300,000 patients in the United States a year. The aim of this randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial was to evaluate whether homeopathy is able to influence long-term outcome in critically ill patients suffering from severe sepsis. 70 patients with severe sepsis receive homeopathic treatment or placebo. Five globules in a potency of 200 C were given at 12 year hours interval during the stay at the intensive care unit. Survival after 30 and 80 days was recorded. Result, on day 180, survival was statistically significantly higher with verum homeopathy, 76% versus 50% a p-value of 0.04. No adverse effects were observed. Yeah. This, here we have a, a, a skeptic from England in The Guardian stating, this RCT trial that has been done time and time again with homeopathy, you find overall that the people getting the placebo sugar pill do just as well as those getting the real posh, expensive, technical, magical, homeopathic peel. Now, a valid question to ask Goldacre is whether he consider the 26% extra debt in the sepsis placebo group doing just as well as the group receiving homeopathy. Now, let's look at a second RCT, um, and this one is of great re uh, interest as researcher were able to isolate the strength of homeopathic response from the clinical skill of the homeopaths. So the way they did this is they, well, let's look, it's on uh, hyperactivity in children. An increasing number of parents turned to homeopathy for treatment of their hyperactive child. Two publications, a randomized partially blind trial and a clinical observation study conclude that homeopathy has positive effect in patients with HDHD. The aim of the study was to obtain scientific evidence of the effectiveness of homeopathy in ADHD. Method. Prior to the randomized double-blind placebo-controlled crossover study, they were treated with individualized prescribed homeopathic medication. So they find out who responds to the remedy. 62 of 83 patients, 75% accuracy in prescribing, who achieve an improvement of 50% in the Connors Global Index, participate in the trial. Results, at the entry of the crossover trial, cognitive performance such as visual global perception, impossibility and divided attention had improved significantly under open label treatment with a p-value of triple zero one. Extraordinary. One chance in 10,000. That is because they isolated, they removed from the equation the prescribing skill. So you're just looking at the reaction to the impact remedy. The trial suggests scientific evidence of the long-term effectiveness of homeopathy in the treatment of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, particularly in the area of behavioral and cognitive function. I have a few minutes, a couple of minutes, to start to look at uh, meta systemic study and meta-analysis. And this is where skeptics say they rely much on the, on the meta-analysis. In 2004, medical historian Michael Dean published the first systematic review of all clinical trial of homeopathy published in the medical literature from 1821 
to until 1998. And he found, uh, and he found and analyzed 45 prospective trials and 205 control trials. Some of the, mind, the main findings of this of his extensive search analysis are homeopathy has a long history of scientifically conduct trials. The use of placebo was largely developed by Hahnemann, who had recognized as early as 1805 the need of a washout period. Homeopathy, I'll, now to the question, is homeopathy clinically relevant? Homeopathy appears, and the, and the study, they conclude, homeopathy does appear to be capable, uh, no, homeopathy appears mostly as safe as reputed. Homeopathy does appear to be capable of influencing global outcome, such as well-being and comorbidity. Economic benefits are noticeable. Skeptics, however, still rely heavily on the now much discredited Shang and all meta-analysis, instead of referring to the, the recent and most comprehensive review ever conducted study on the effectiveness, safety, cost effectiveness, and real-world outcome of homeopathy, which is referred as the Swiss study, which I'll continue after uh, I, I come back. Thank you. Thank you. Challenging the very nature of water and making sure that you never pass a water filtration plant and look at it the same again. Please, uh, a big hand for Andre Sen. You've already heard from Joe Schwartz tonight by uh, reading his words. Now here to defend himself in person, uh, please, Dr. Joe. You have 30 minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> and those of you who are new to McGill, uh, welcome. I'm not sure why I'm needed. Andre made my case. He made it very well. You referred to me. Uh, I stand by everything that I said. Uh, but you want some detail. So the question before us is whether or not homeopathy is effective medicine, or is it a placebo? In fact, it's the wrong question, because it means that a placebo cannot be an effective medicine. It can be both. There's no dichotomy here. It is true that I believe that homeopathy is chemically and biologically implausible, but I also believe that it can be psychologically very compelling. Those are also not incompatible with each other. First, what homeopathy is not. It is not herbal medicine. It is not acupuncture. It is not reflexology, aromatherapy, or any of those. It is a distinct system, and that already was described, of like curing like. A healthy person develops a symptom into a large dose. That is used in smaller doses as curative. And those medicines can come from many, many areas, from plants, from animal stuff, minerals, etc. That's the essence of uh, homeopathy as conceived by Samuel Hahnemann way back in uh, around 1800. He was indeed a very, very interesting man. He graduated from medicine. He did not like the lancet, which of course was used to bleed people in those days. He did not like leeching. He didn't like the horrific things that physicians did in those days. Because basically, when you got better, it was in spite of the physician, not because of him. Hahnemann wanted something different. He wanted a kinder, gentler therapy. And he is to be commended for that. Malaria was a scourge at that time, as unfortunately it still is today. But there was a treatment which was cinchona bark. And Hahnemann was aware of this. And he experimented on himself. He wanted to know what was the right dose to give to his patient. So he kept taking bigger and bigger doses to see what would happen. And he took these doses, and eventually he developed fever, much like he saw in his malaria patients. And then came to the conclusion that a substance that in a healthy person causes a certain disease can cure that person, can cure a sick person who has those symptoms. He began to investigate other materials. Arsenic, for example, in terms of provings, as he called them, he would give it in increasing doses to friends, family members, etc. 
and cause symptoms. For example, in this case, gastric pain, vomiting, and diarrhea. He lost some friends and relatives along the way. <laughs> but he concluded that therefore, in smaller doses, this would be a remedy for food poisoning, because those are the symptoms that one experiences with food poisoning. And he developed a whole system of Materia Medica, numerous such provings. And then he came to the conclusion, somehow nobody seems to be able to explain exactly how he came to this conclusion, that less is more the theory of infinitesimals, that if you dilute your product, your original solution, you make it more potent. Well, one day he made a house call, and he answered this house call in a horse-drawn carriage. And his homeopathic remedy worked extremely well on the patient. And he developed the second aspect of homeopathy, percussion. He believed that the cobblestones had shaken the medication, and that potentiated it. So the two aspects. So dilution, which of course is still very, very much part of homeopathy. You dilute, you dilute, dilute in water and alcohol. And as was already mentioned, once you get to about 12C, there's not a single molecule of the original that is left. That, of course, can be calculated. So that when you buy a remedy, a homeopathic remedy like this one here, which is based on acetic acid, uh, it doesn't have a single molecule of the original substance. But that solution, which doesn't have anything, has been impregnated into a sugar pill, which is not expected to somehow have any kind of an effect on, on the solution. Of course, once the water evaporates, there's no water there left. So what is there? A ghost of, of the molecules. Well, where, when would you use uh, this, prop, this particular product? Well, the provings have shown that it can be used if you have this particular uh, issue or if you suffer from sausage poisoning. I'm not sure how they arrive at that, but that comes from the Materia Medica directly for this particular uh, homeopathic product. Once you get to the 30C dilution, which was favored by Hahnemann, a patient would have to consume an unbelievable amount of the so-called remedy in order to encounter a single molecule. And furthermore, at that dilution, you're not even going to encounter a water molecule that has encountered the original uh, material. But this was, of course, not known to Hahnemann because Canizar or uh, Avogadro and Dalton's theories were basically just formulated in the middle 1800s about atoms, and Hahnemann knew nothing about that. So within his frame of reference, it kind of made sense. And he based it all on his own experience. His patients got better, and they loved him. Of course they did, because he didn't make them vomit, didn't create diarrhea, he didn't do the horrific bleeding that other physicians were doing. Even Napoleon was into homeopathy, his pubic lice were treated with it, but history does not record whether or not this was successful. But not everyone was enamored. Sir John Forbes, Queen Victoria's physician, didn't like the idea of homeopathy. He thought that it outstretched the boundaries of, of science. But there were some remarkable homeopathic products developed in those days. Homeopathic cocoa, as you can see, it would last for 12,545,000. 7,298 years. I'm not sure exactly how that was calculated. But even Fry came up with homeopathic cocoa. I think in this case, it's pretty descriptive because there's nothing in there. So I think we can really call this uh, a legitimate product. But of course, the whole issue really boiled to the fore in terms of modern science. In the journal Nature, a very reputable journal in 1988, with this study that was carried out by Jacques Benveniste, a highly respected uh, biochemist in those days, and he maintained that in his experiment he found a solution that reacted to an antigen in spite of the fact that there was no molecule left. And he submitted this paper to Nature. Well, this of course caused a large controversy, especially when he said that his solution worked only when shaken and not when stirred. Well, James Bond perhaps was a homeopathic I know that has to be investigated whether or not the shaken or disturbed martini has any kind of a chemical difference. But anyway, Nature agreed to publish the, this journal, this article, with a proviso. This is the first time anything like that ever happened, this proviso. They would publish the paper, but because all the referees said it was unbelievable, but they believed the data that Ben Veniste had done this, they would publish it with the proviso that an investigative group would go into Ben Beniste's lab and under his super, supervision attempt to reproduce the experiment. This is just what happened. 
Now, the homeopathic proponents, of course, stood behind this. They believed Benveniste. In fact, David Riley, highly respected, said, if we prove the observations wrong, we've exposed homeopathy as one of the medical science's greatest misadventures, a huge folly. That's what he said. Well, the group, of course, found that the experiment could not be re reproduced. And it turned out, Nature published it, that it, high dilution was, in fact, delusion. So that's where Benveniste stood at that, that point. He didn't give up. He said that his experiments were sound and that he would eventually reproduce it. That never happened. We're not quite sure why, but the technician who worked on this had a very, very close relationship with Jacques Benveniste. Some would say too close. And that she was actually doctoring the data in order to please him. We cannot prove that to another, uh, but it seems to be a possible explanation given all the information that, that we, we have, are now privy to. Benveniste went on to found a company called DigiBio, and he said that homeopathic information could actually be transmitted through the internet. And he carried out experiments whereby he said that this could in fact be done. Well, this I think does not stand up to the rigors of what we science-based medicine, which has four basic pillars. Of course, we rely on peer review. We do rely on plausibility because we have a large mountain of scientific knowledge upon which we can stand and gaze out at the world and judge to see what makes sense and what doesn't. And of course, experience plays a role as does critical thinking. But really, the cornerstones are peer review and plausibility. And this cannot be discounted as I said, because we know a lot about how the world works. And water having memory is not plausible based upon the chemistry, the biology, and the physics that we know. I'm not going to get into the battle of papers because there are 6,500 peer-reviewed journals in the world every minute of every day. There's four new peer-reviewed publications that come out. They can be put on a bell curve like everything else in the world is. Some are excellent, some are terrible, most are mediocre. So it is possible to take a look and cherry pick and show anything you want with the literature. That's why we don't get into the paper versus paper. That's why plausibility is very important in terms of memory effects. Water does not have memory. Water molecules move around all the time. Yes, there are momentary associations, picoseconds, that's an unbelievably small time frame. Water doesn't hold any kind of memory. And if it did, why doesn't it remember everything else that it came into contact with? That water has been down through sewers. It has been through taps. How come that there's no memory of, of that? Well, some people say because it can be wiped out. This company sells a filter to make homeopathic water. And they pass the water through the crystal so that it erases all its previous memories. I don't think that that is particularly scientifically sound. But of course, what we want is the evidence. Never mind the, the possibilities, never mind the extreme dilution. I will accept the fact that there are some anomalous findings, as, as Andre pointed out, and in, in respect to journals. But that's not the point. The point is, so what if there is something anomalous found? How does that translate to curing, to therapy? I would even grant the fact that water can hold memory. Okay, let's say that it can. What does that have to do with healing anything? So let's look at evidence. Some homeopaths say that they can actually detect which is a homeopathic remedy by dowsing, by swinging a pendulum over, over this. We've tested some of these people. The tests are very clear. They get it right about half the time, which is exactly what you would get uh, randomly, statistically. Are there positive peer-reviewed trials of homeopathy? You bet they are. Andre pointed out some. This particular one, indeed on sepsis, makes use of a plant product in extreme dilution, and indeed the conclusion is that, that there is an effect. Of course there is. You will find in the scientific literature positive and negative studies for anything. That's why we look further than that. We look further than the journals of homeopathy and alternative medicine where most of these appear. We look at everything. We look at the meta-analyses. Meta-analyses are real. Of course, some of them can be criticized. But this is what we look at. The first real meta-analysis was done in, in 97 of homeopathy. And it came to an interesting conclusion that 
it seemed that there was something more than just a placebo effect. This has been quoted all the time. While the same researchers, as more evidence came to light, published this paper, which hardly ever gets quoted, and there it is, they realized that when further studies were done, the evidence just evaporated. And this is what we see. When better studies are done with more people, with more controls, the evidence seems to evaporate. Then, of course, there was the analysis that Andre referred to, uh, which I certainly don't dismiss. There are problems with some of the papers in there, but they looked at a huge number of papers. And even the criticism of this analysis has been widely criticized. But the basic conclusion was that there is no better than placebo. The Cochrane Collaboration, one of the most reputable organizations in the world, they have no vested interest whatsoever. They have looked at homeopathy, did a meta-analysis, looked at all of the trials. Again, the conclusion is that it is a placebo effect. James Randi, who we had here in this very room as a guest, some of you were probably here two years ago, uh, he was asked to supervise a specific trial on Horizon, a wonderful British TV program. And they sent out samples to scientists who claimed that they could distinguish between homeopathic products and, and others. The result, as you can see, was that they were unable to do so. The experiment was a complete failure. This was repeated here in Canada on Marketplace. They did a very, very good analysis of this. You can get all the videos at, at that website and see what Canada was able to, to, to find. Homeopaths argue that homeopathy is not susceptible to scientific analysis in the same way because of the individualized treatment. It's true, it is individualized, but that is also curious because there have been studies where the same patient with the same symptoms has gone to numerous homeopaths and gets completely different advice. So I'm not sure how that makes sense. As far as the animal homeopathy goes, uh, it is true animals are not susceptible to the placebo effect the same way they're humans, but humans who look after the animals are. And here too, placebo controlled trials have been done. We can you know, get into this, who has the better trials, et, et cetera. But just think about whether or not plausibility should play a role. In Switzerland, the, uh, the Swiss government has decided that uh, homeopathy can be put on the national health scheme. This caused a lot of, of controversy because they claim to have evidence for the benefits of homeopathy. This also has been investigated thoroughly, and it turns out that all of the members on the committee who made that, that recommendation in Switzerland had some connection to homeopathy or a homeopathic uh, uh, producer. In England, the House of Commons struck a committee, the uh, Technology, Science and Technology Committee, to look into homeopathy, and they came up with uh, the recommendation that it should not be on the National Health Service. After consulting experts across England, and these were scientists themselves. In Canada, homeopathy is legal, of course, and you can buy homeopathic products. They must have a DIN number, which I think to many people suggests that this is approved by Health Canada as safe and effective. Not the case. It does not have to be proven effective. It is, of course, safe because there's nothing in there. So homeopathy is regulated in Canada in this rather bizarre way, but there's absolutely no requirement to prove any kind of efficacy. Is there any risk? Well, you can take oscillococinum for the flu. There's not going to be any risk because basically what you have here is a homeopathic preparation made from the liver and the heart of a duck. But it is at a concentration of 200 C which as we have seen is incredibly dilute. There's not a single molecule. So one duck is enough to supply the homeopathic demands of the world for several years with uh, oscillococinum. But it won't do you any harm. And indeed, uh, critics of homeopathy have clearly shown this uh, by taking various homeopathic medications in huge doses. And uh, they guzzle the bottles tablet after tablet after tablet and show that, of course, nothing happens. Uh, of course, the homeopaths will argue that this is the wrong way because they're taking more and more of the stuff, whereas potency increases as you take less and less. So, of course, nothing happens to them if they take more and more. If they want to really prove the toxicity of homeopathy, they should forget to take the pill. Then something would happen. There are some incredibly strange 
homeopathic remedies, and they're out there on the market. Now, I would think that most honest homeopaths are not into this, and I would hope that Andre would agree with me that homeopathic remedies based on Berlin Wall are not reputable. The idea here is that the Berlin Wall in healthy people caused anxiety, and therefore a homeopathic preparation made from the Berlin Wall relieves anxiety. There have been really bizarre things. This homeopath in Germany thinks that homosexuality can be cured homeopathically. That is not only scientifically absurd, but it is morally absurd as well. After the Fukushima accident, well, now we're talking about more significant risk because some homeopaths said, forget any kind of other protection. This is what you need, homeopathic remedies that can protect against radiation. Homeopaths without borders, who have no connection to, homeo or, or to doctors without borders, say that in Haiti, for example, when the rainy season comes, you have to worry about dengue, malaria, etc. All of that is true. I don't think homeopathy is going to be the solution there. And Jeremy Scher, who is the founder of homeopathy for health in Africa, believes that AIDS can be cured homeopathically. I know, as all homeopaths do, I don't think that that is the case, that you can just about cure AIDS in many cases, but of course he's not allowed to say this because the pharmaceutical companies would get after him because he's got this simple remedy for, for AIDS. In England, unfortunately, many homeopaths recommend homeopathic prophylaxis for people who are going into mosquito-infested areas. Homeopathy does not work to protect you against malaria. People have succumbed to this. They also treat HPV infections homeopathically. That's a serious disease. We're not talking about the common cold here. We're talking about human papillomavirus. Now, some of these alternative websites that recommend homeopathy, and I don't mean to suggest at all that all homeopaths would be in this category, but some are. But of course, some doctors also do crazy things. But in this, uh, this particular popular website, uh, which recommends homeopathy, they also tell you that the American Medical Association is really should be called the American Murder Association because of all the terrible things that they do. And they advise people to avoid chemotherapy and radiation in favor of homeopathy. That's where we get into the real problems because there are homeopathic clinics that claim to be treat and cure cancer and desperate people will do desperate things. There's absolutely nothing wrong with experimenting with homeopathy when someone has some terrible disease and they have run the conventional gamut and nothing has helped. I can certainly appreciate that. In fact, I can't guarantee that I wouldn't do that myself. But when someone chooses that over some established conventional treatment, we have a real problem and it has happened many times. But I give you just one particular case. It's a very unfortunate case and got a lot of publicity in Australia. Young lady in her 40s diagnosed with bowel cancer. She was of the natural mind and she didn't want to engage in chemotherapy. She didn't want the surgery that was recommended. She went to a homeopath. This homeopath told her, we have the direct quote, you must use homeopathy alone. Classical homeopathy will cure you, whereas chemo and surgery will not. As you can imagine, the story has a very sad ending, and uh, it is obviously a legal case. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see just what happens here, but of course, the poor victim cannot be brought back. Here's the coroner's report, and uh, you can see that uh, desperate people will do desperate things, and the decision was made by herself and, and her husband, who was also a believer in, in uh, alternative medicine, and uh, she paid the price because with the kind of cancer that she had, uh, a cure probably would have been affected. So why does homeopathy persist in spite of all of this? Because the placebo effect is very powerful, 30 to 40% of the time, it will work in almost any condition. It is just an amazing phenomenon, and it's very real. The fact that it's in the mind is irrelevant. If you feel better, you do feel better. It doesn't mean that you are better, it doesn't mean that there has been any kind of physiological cure inside, but you do feel better. We also have the so-called regression to the mean. I know that sounds scientific, but basically what it means is that many conditions are cyclical. And one week you may feel good, the next week you don't feel good, that's when you go to the alternative therapist. 
And of course, if you get naturally better, that gets the credit. That's the regression to the mean. Very often, standard treatments are also being used, and yet the alternative therapy gets the credit. And lifestyle changes, very often good lifestyle changes are recommended by homeopaths. Exercise, good diet, etc. That may make a difference. And there is the fear of conventional treatment. People don't want chemo. They don't want surgery. Much, much safer, gentler to swallow a sugar pill. So all of these together make homeopathy acceptable. Back to Hahnemann, which is where we started. Remember that he started with the whole notion of taking cinchona in larger and larger doses to trigger the symptoms of malaria. That's the foot upon which homeop homeopathy stands originally. Has anyone ever tried to replicate that? Yes. In 1991, German professor Wilhelm Hoff did the experiment, started to take cinchona bark in bigger and bigger doses and never got a fever, never got the malaria symptoms. So we don't know what happened in the case of Hahnemann. Maybe he was unlucky, he was taking the cinchona doses and he got the flu at the same time. And that's what caused the fever and that's what created his, his tenet. But he was a good man, there's no question about that. He wanted to go, he recognized the, the ills of conventional medicine at that time. He now rests in Switzerland, uh, Paris, Paris. His, uh, um, stand corrected, it is Paris. Yeah. Uh, this really is, I think, the most appropriate statement to make about uh, uh, his, his career. And again, you know, we can look at the studies and uh, big, many experts, of course, have done that. And there are pro studies, as Andre has pointed out, but I can tell you that for every one of those studies, there is a whole, uh, large number of experts who will criticize it and who will give you piles of, of other studies. But I certainly agree that, that while homeopathy itself is scientifically implausible, homeopaths can be beneficial to many people. We see this because when you do surveys, very often people express their satisfaction. They'll express their satisfaction. On, on homeopathy, because the consultation is what is important. The homeopath himself or herself is a wonderful placebo. Doctors these days don't have much time. As soon as you sit down, they start looking at their watch. They'll tell you, you have two questions to ask, or I have 10 minutes for you. Actually, 10 minutes is quite long. The average in North America is about seven minutes. So, of course, people are dissatisfied with the kind of conventional care that they are getting. With a homeopath, you will sit down. They will discuss every aspect of your life. They will ask you probing questions. They really seem to care about what is going on. And very often, that's what people need. They need their souls massaged. And that is not to be this meaning, because that is very important. Uh, many diseases are cyclical and there's nothing you can do about them. Not Pardon? Not uh, absolutely not. Did I ever say I was? Did I ever ask for, did, 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 did I ask for a comment from the audience? Okay. We will ask for comments and then you can say anything that you want. But at this point, uh, you maintain respect and sit quietly. So, 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 yeah, you can clap. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, there, of course, there, there's a lot of satisfaction from, from homeopaths, and there's no question that when you go to a consulting homeopath who really knows the ins and outs, there are many people who benefit greatly from that. And after all, you know, uh, the royal family in England uh, stands by this. Not that you know, they're the real beacon. Uh, I mean, obviously, when Prince Philip had a more serious problem, he ended up in a hospital. He didn't go to a, a, a homeopath. So basically, Andre and I have different views on, uh, on homeopathy. I certainly do not in any way suggest that homeopathy should be banned or that it should be legally controlled. Uh, that's not my point at all. I, I think that homeopathy can serve a, a purpose. But I think one has to be very careful in making the choices. 
about when homeopathy is appropriate and when conventional medicine is appropriate. And I think that whether or not uh, the extreme dilution uh, has some sort of, of strange property uh, is irrelevant because it has nothing to do with, with the potential of cure. Why should that image, ghostly image in the water have anything to do with cure and how is that ghostly image transferred to the sugar pill and why doesn't the sugar pill have any effect? Anyway, those are things that can be uh, further debated. But uh, so is um, homeopathy good medicine or is it a placebo? The truth, of course, is that it is both. And there's nothing wrong with having an effective placebo. As long as it is honestly delivered and as long as a patient is not being tricked that something else is happening than what is actually going on. So we will certainly be happy to uh, take your questions and to uh, discuss this uh, back and forth. But there you have two distinct views on, uh, on homeopathy. And I guess it is up to you to make up your mind about which is the more scientific approach. So thanks very much for your attention. And thank you very much, Joe Schwartz, mixing homeopathy with humor and humanity, uh, Dr. Joe. So you've heard two very conflicting opinions. We now turn to a bit of a rebuttal. I now invite Andre Sen to, he has exactly 10 minutes to respond. Again, please, no heckling from the audience. This is not what we want to get into. Please respect the speakers. Keep your comments to yourselves. There are question cards going around. Questions will be posed to the, uh, to the speakers if they're legible and I can read them. And as a doctor, I can tell you I can read almost anything. Uh, Andre, you have 10 minutes to rebu rebuke and rebuke uh, the statements of Dr. Schwartz. Okay, thank you. Uh, Joe, with all due respect, I think you're behind science. Science is moving along and there's a lot of articles, that, of course, and if you don't look at it, it's going to go beyond. And uh, uh, there's, uh, to compare Randy and Marketplace with researchers from renowned center doesn't equal. It does not equal. There's scientists, serious scientists out there making ser serious research. And the work of, of Benevinci was uh, uh, replicated by several labs since. And it was published a long time ago, over 10 years ago. In terms of history, Joe, you don't know your history. Uh, the process of dilution and succussion, serial dilution and succussion, was not an invention of Hahnemann. It, is, it has been known at least since Paracelsus. And Hahnemann used crude dose at least until 1822. In other ways, he went through the process of serial dilution slowly and slowly over the years. It's only around 1812 that he went beyond Avocado's number. It took many years. It was not a, a flash of genius. It was a process of experimentation. And as he experimented, he noticed greater response from the patients. He said, let's do it further, greater response. And which is uh, uh, confirmed now with the work on, on uh, nanobubbles, where there's an augmentation of the effect. In terms of the placebo effect, Joe, I think you're in the 18, 1955 with Beaker's study of the powerful Beaker uh, uh, placebo effect. The, the effect, this was reviewed many, many times since eight, 1955, and the Cochrane uh, uh, collaboration came out, I think, this year with a review of all the trials where they compare placebo with effective treatment and a no treatment arm. And when they use this, uh, about, they look at about 200 trials with a no, treat, no treatment arm, and they find out the placebo effect in clinical trial is really negligible. Uh, I was telling you that I'm going to present the finding of the most, uh, the, the most uh, uh, comprehensive review of homeopathy. This was the, the one that I referred before and Joe also referred uh, but it's also called as a Swiss study. Here, this is a health technology assessment conducted over a period of seven years by scientists for the Swiss government. So this was independent scientists. There was eight scientists, and two of them, three of them, sorry, were also practicing homeopath. But the, the, the editor were neurosurgeon and psychiatrist, nothing to do with homeopathy. They were scientists specialized to analyze trial, nothing to do with homeopathy. And there were uh, uh, other scientists that were involved. Only three had knowledge of homeopathy, of the eight. 
uh, an HTA is an established scientific procedure with, which in contrast with a meta-analysis like Shang and systematic review examine not only the efficacy of homeopathy but especially its real-world effectiveness, its appropriateness, safety, and economy. HDAs are therefore much wider in scope and politically more informative. For the evaluation of the effectiveness of homeopathy, all available systematic review were examined. All meta-analyses were prepared by the Institute of Social and Preventive Medicine of the University of Bern, where Shang was, which is specialized on research on public health issue. A total of 22 reviews were analyzed. The synopsis of study result found at least a trend in favor of homeopathy in 20 of the 22 reviews. A follow-up study with very high external validity, i.e. The, the investigation of the effectiveness of individualized classical homeopathy also prov provide strong evidence of effect effectiveness. In contrast, to this subsidiary result, the Shang and all of the Lancet in 2005, this much more comprehensive and differentiated HDA showed that homeopathy was effective, safe, and cost-efficient. It reevaluated Shang, a quantitative analysis taking into consideration criteria of external validity and internal validity, and found a truly remarkable result in favor of homeopathy. We have to remember six of the trials were imitation. Final conclusion, the real world effectiveness, effectively likely, questionable, or likely, homeopathy falls within the category effectively likely. Safety, medical homeopathy in Switzerland has few side effects if professionally executed. And the use of high potency is free from toxic effect. What more do you want? Well, economy perhaps. With pharmaceutical costs being what they are, the use of homeopathy has the potential to lower pharmaceutical spending. In summary, it can be said there is sufficient evidence for the preclinical effectiveness and the clinical efficacy of homeopathy and for its safety, economy, and economy compared with conventional treatment. In January 2011, the Swiss Federal Department of Home Affairs decided that homeopathy will be included in the Swiss statutory health insurance and be reimbursed for a minimum of six years, a bit more advanced than here. Now, probably the most compelling of all evidence is the epidemiological evidence. In 2003, I began a, re a review of the literature on homeopathy in times of epidemic. So far, I have accumulated over 7,000 references 7,000 references on this uh, subject. 2,000 of these references have already been uh, read and integrated into a comprehensive text. And here you can appreciate the different disease that have been investigated so far. Now, one of the findings, the main finding of this uh, comprehensive review of the literature, which include all the epidemics that where homeopathy was involved in all over the world, from uh, 17, the earliest one was 1796 with scarlet, uh, scarlet fever until uh, now with uh, leptocirrhosis in Cuba. The, the, the main findings was result obtained by homeopathy during epidemic reveals a very important and clear constancy, a very low mortality rate. This constancy remains regardless of the physician time, place, or time of epidemical disease, including disease carrying a very high mortality rate, such as cholera, smallpox, diphtheria, typhoid fever, etc. I'll give you an example. In 1849, there was a major epidemic of cholera all over the world, but we're going to focus only on Cincinnati. Pulte and Ehrman treated 2,600 cases with 35 deaths, or a mortality rate of 1.3%. Cholera, the mortality of cholera in the 19th century was 50%, regardless of the physician, the place, the country, or whether patients were treated. Like in Asia, in Egypt, in Tunisia, in uh, 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 Turkey, they didn't have treatment. And the mortality was around 50%. Regardless of the treatment, the mortality was 50%. And despite having had 60 to 70 cases that were in a deep state of collapse. Now, 
Uh, no. Now, uh, there was an if yeah, there was an, there was a, a skeptic that uh, said that these were raw, they, they cheated. So there was a commission that was uh, in, instigated, and the commission was chaired by Alfonso Taft, who became Secretary of State eventually, or Secretary of War under Grant, and his son became President of the United States. So reputable person, and the commission uh, 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 outcome was the 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 what the OMIPAT had report was exactly true to the point, to the every single case. I'm going to look at a second disease. If I have one minute, it's pneumonia. Uh, Osler reported that the, 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 the mortality of pneumonia around since the 1850 has been steady at 30 percent. Even himself at John Hopkins at 30 percent. Homeopaths will get will obtain result with uh, less than two percent, and usually more like a one percent. It's remarkable when we consider that one out of 25 Canadians dies of pneumonia now when uh, you could, uh, we could lower the mortality dramatically just by using those little, uh, uh, little pills that Joe is, is talking about, that good, those good placebo. Uh, it's, it's the, 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 I have been in practice for 30 years. I've seen the worst case of patient with acute and chronic disease. And I can testify to you that there's nothing in the history of medicine, which I've studied extensively, and I've studied, I already also uh, published, uh, not published, but written a thesis on the placebo effect in homeopathy, so I'm uh, very aware of the placebo effect, that there's nothing in the history of medicine that can come close to homeopathy. This is the future of medicine. If you want to move forward, move towards homeopathy. If you're a scientist, uh, basic science, move towards the study of nanoparticles and so on. It's the future. Not, we're not looking behind now. S science is moving forward. Hahnemann was a precursor of nanotechnology, and I have to stop here. Andre Sen demonstrating that it is possible to be told to stop on time and stop on time. Thank you, Andre. I know there's more where that came from. Dr. Schwartz, you have 10 minutes to, rebut to provide your rebuttal for Andre Sen. Well, a Andre says that the, the future of medicine is homeopathy. That leaves me speechless. I, that, that's one I, I cannot argue with. The placebo effect, uh, um, you know what? I, I will later defer to world's expert, we have uh, Dr. Raz sitting in the front here who probably is the world's expert on placebo effect. I think he can address your questions better on that and uh, point you in the, in the right direction. Uh, Andre originally mentioned that the arguments today uh, about homeopathy uh, haven't changed much since, uh, since Hahnemann. Well, yeah, I think that that makes for a very, very interesting case. How come that we're arguing the same things? Science tends to be a self-correcting discipline. And the corrections, you know, it may take a little time. It may take a decade or even two decades, but it, it gets corrected. How come that we're still arguing about the same thing? Just think of other uh, uh, medicines. Think of aspirin. Are we arguing about whether or not aspirin works? Do we argue about whether or not penicillin works? Do we argue about whether or not vitamin C prevents scurvy? Do we argue about whether vitamin D prevents rickets? No, we don't argue about these things, but about every one of those, there were arguments and there was a lot of controversy. And I suspect that if we go back 100 years, we could have taken any one of those issues and have this kind of debate. I can tell you that when William Withering first introduced the idea that foxglove could cure uh, dropsy, as they called it then, which of course was uh, congestive heart disease, he was opposed. There would have been debates just like this, probably a lot more acrimonious. People said, are you crazy? You know, how can you think that, that you know, the, the just uh, chewing the, the foxglove plant is, go, is going to cure heart disease? Well, eventually, of course, it was proven because the scientific evidence became clear. And today, digitalis, of course, which was uh, the active ingredient in there, is the accepted therapy. But we don't go and tell people to graze in a, in a field of foxglove if they have congestive heart disease. We've been able to isolate the active ingredient, standardize it, measure it, and know how much to recommend. There is a fixed amount measurable in milligrams. That's what we know 
is in there. It's not the ghost of some molecule that is in there. And of course, the, the same thing goes for the, the numerous effective interventions that have been introduced. Almost everything at the beginning is opposed. That's, that's history. Not only in, in medication, when, when microwave ovens were first introduced, a lot of criticism. We are now seeing that with, with cell phones and Wi-Fi. You know, new technology breeds criticism, but eventually the truth comes out. So why are we arguing about exactly the same thing that we were arguing about 250 years ago? Andre says that I've been left behind, that I don't know my science. I think I'm pretty up to date on science. I'm pretty up to date on the literature. I have read all of those papers about the nanoparticles. They have absolutely nothing to do with homeopathy. They have to do with some anomalous findings and some solutions. They, virtually all of them have been explained. Whether or not it's particles dissolving from the glass or whether it's an overgrowth of bacteria that were inadvertently uh, introduced, I mean, there are explanations there. Uh, Rustam Roy, who was referred to, is not highly regarded in the scientific community. He is one of those outliers, and there are many such. They tend to be highly vocal. The only way that you can get a real good feel for what is really going on is not by sitting here and listening to us and judging you know, who, who has the bigger impact. That's not how it works. You have to do the legwork. You have to go and read the literature yourself. You have to take a look who is saying what. Who are the reputable sources? Are you going to refer to someone who has spent their life working on research in this area or someone who just uh, uh, is making money off of uh, providing some sort of, uh, of therapy? So it's a question of, of really doing the work. No one can do this for you. If you're really interested in homeopathy, start reading. Go to the web. There's a tremendous amount of information. I would recommend that you take a look at Science-Based Medicine, which is an absolutely wonderful website. And that is, it's a conglomerate of people, but they are all highly respected. I mean, they're even by their opponents, they're respected because they have stellar careers. They have published in scientific literature hundreds and hundreds of articles. Science-Based Medicine, take a look at how they evaluate homeopathy. And there's, there, there is no acrimony there. It is all done uh, scientifically. Now, Andre also mentioned that, that um, the Horizon program on which Randy was on is not reputable. It is an extremely reputable program. Uh, those of you who watch the BBC probably know how the BBC works. It, it's not like uh, the CBC or the American channels. They do things right. And uh, <laughs> they, they really did that one right. They really did that one right. They set up the experiments exactly the way that the proponents of homeopathy wanted it set up. So they were asked to do what they claimed to be able to do, to differentiate between the solutions. The only reason Randy was called in is not because he's an expert on homeopathy. No, he's an expert on how you get information and on how easily one can be misled inadvertently. So that's why he was called in, just as a safeguard. And the results were very clear. They could not distinguish. As you know, Randy has the $1 million offer to anyone who can experimentally demonstrate any of the so-called paranormal effects, and homeopathy is in that category. Randy offers the $1 million to anyone who can distinguish whether or not a sugar pill is just a sugar pill or is it a homeopathic sugar pill. Well, if all of these experiments that have been quoted here can do that, why aren't these people lining up for that million dollars? Research grants these days are very hard to come by. Let me tell you, a million dollars is, is a lot of money, right? If someone can do that, why aren't they lining up? After all, homeopaths claim that their product is different from an ordinary sugar pill. Why can that not be demonstrated? So again, you know, I, I'm, I'm not uh, at all saying that uh, you know, homeopaths don't have value. I, I, I fully agree with you know, what Andre has been saying, that his patients can be very, very satisfied. That's, that, 
you know, there's no contesting that. The question is why they are being satisfied. And what I say is that the theory that non-existent molecules succussed in some specific way uh, can actually have a physiological effect I say is scientifically implausible and unacceptable because we have enough scientific evidence, knowledge upon which to make that statement. And it is up to those who make an unusual claim to come up with the evidence. So if homeopaths claim that their drugs are different from just a sugar pill, let it be proven in the laboratory in some way. Thank you very much, Joe. Okay, this brings us to the uh, portion of the evening where it's your turn to ask questions. You've done so. I've received a number of index cards. I'd now like to invite both Andre and Joe to please come and take a seat up on the seats up here, and I will begin to read questions. Okay, before we get to the audience questions, I'd like to invite our two speakers. You have one question each. Uh, to ask, uh, sorry, two questions each. I'd like to t you each to take it in turns to ask your question. I'll let uh, Andre, you begin. Your one qu first question for Dr. Schwartz. Joe, I see that you're still convinced that homeopathy is mere placebo. What would it take, what kind of convincing evidence will it take? A properly controlled, randomized trial. <laughs> that's, a, that's all we ask for in science. Well, actually, we asked for more than one properly controlled randomized trial because one trial doesn't mean much. But if we have a selection of properly controlled randomized trials, yes, I would buy it. You, you show me what you consider is a properly controlled randomized trial for a specific condition, for a specific condition where a specific homeopathic remedy cures that condition. Okay, the answering science with science. Professor Schwartz, your question for Andre. Why are you not trying to cash in on the million dollars that Randy offers, if you can tell the difference? <laughs> Why are you sitting here for free when you could be making a million dollars? That's called the million dollar question, folks. Listen, I am a physician, I'm a clinician. First of all, I don't deal with magician, first. Second is to do the, the, the work, you would have to have access to ex uh, spectroscopy equipment that only you and professor at the university will have access. So you are the one that could do it. And you, we could, I could tell you it's how to done. do it. I could tell you how to do it. We could split the money. Half the money could go. <laughs> ah, a counter offer. Half the money, I like it. Half the money could go to the Office of Science for Science and Society, and half would go for homeopathy. I, I, I think I better rely on the sales of my books if I want to make money. <laughs> you saw it here, folks, the, the prize-winning money split. Okay, Andre, your next question and second question for Professor Schwartz. Okay. Joe, you have a loved one that is in ICU with sepsis. There's a study that shows that there is 26% more death in the placebo group versus the, the Verum group. Would you suggest that the, your, your loved one be treated with homeopathy? Or we would say, don't do it. The person is unconscious. Uh, I would take the physician's uh, opinion on, on uh, what the appropriate medication is. If the appropriate medication isn't working, I might give it a shot. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. the physician would say, the patient is not responding. Mm -hmm. okay. The patient is not responding, I would give it a shot. Desperate people do desperate things. You can never predict what you will do in a desperate situation. Okay, so if it happens... That takes care of at least three okay. of the questions yeah. from the audience. <laughs> Dr. Schwartz, thank you okay. for answering that. It was either you personally or a loved one. Uh, Professor Schwartz, your last question for Andre Sanders. When is the last time you've been to a physician and why? I'm in my, I, I am a physician and I'm always a real, watching myself a real, in the room. Uh, a conventionally trained <laughs> physician. I, 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 will give you, I will give you an out if this an, is a very an, personal question. You, you may duck the question, but The we'll last let it time stand. is when I had a, a fracture of the skull uh, three years ago, seven uh, fracture of the skull three years ago. That was my last visit at the... Uh, the, uh, so you would not visit a doctor for anything other than an emergency type situation? No, we ref I refer patients to a uh, specialist. Uh, I, I need to, have, uh, uh, to, to extend my, my uh, diagnostic uh, field, so I will refer and say, give me an opinion on what's the problem with this patient. I need to know. But I, a, a, a family physician cannot have access to all these, this, this equipment and laboratory uh, studies. Uh, we need specialists that are uh, capable to do this. But in terms of therapeutics, I rely 
on, on, on uh, uh, methods uh, that are sure, certain, gentle, not dangerous, and effective. So you, no blood tests, nothing like no, that? No, 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 no. We, we do blood tests. We, do, we, we, we look at lab. Of course we do. But All you yourself, is a science. you yourself have never gone to a doctor to have a blood test I done? I ordered a blood test for myself. I can... Yeah, but you need someone to interpret it. No, I can't interpret it. I have done a course of medicine. I am considered a physician in the state of Oregon. I practice... I wrote my exam, my basic uh, uh, science exam, uh, sitting side by side with the, the graduate of the medical school. Okay, we'll, okay, exam. We'll yes, I'm going to stop we'll this because this is really not an ad hominem argument. This is about homeopathy and not our, our professional qualifications. I'm now going to turn some questions from the audience. Um, the first one for Dr. Schwartz, and this is asking whether if homeopathic substances are purely physio psychological placebos, uh, do you think that the evidence that they can work in animals and plants has any weight? Uh, I thought that I addressed that. There, there have been many, many publications on, on uh, uh, homeopathy in animals. Uh, each of those trials, the, the ones that have shown some positive effect, is outweighed by the trials that have not shown any effect. So if you look at the meta-analysis and you look at the properly controlled studies, there's nothing there. Uh, sometimes, you know, it, it is indeed very interesting because people will interpret what their animals are doing or how they're behaving in different ways subjectively when the objective behavior is, is exactly the same. Uh, people love their pets, and uh, there have been studies that show this. You give your pet a homeopathic remedy, and you have an objective observer evaluate whether there's any difference, and they, have, they will say, no, there isn't, but you as the pet owner will look at the same pet and see that it's getting better. Uh, I mean, we, we've uh, actually, many, many years ago, we, we, we did a little uh, experiment that was not well enough done to be, to be published, where we had people, uh, we solicited, solicited students during the cold season, and we had, I, I think, about 20 students who were coughing and sneezing, and we recorded, uh, in those days it was on a tape recorder, we recorded their coughing and sneezing frequency. So we had the data. And then we gave them a sugar pill, but we told them that this was a new medication that had just come out for the cold. It was, of course, a sugar pill. We didn't have to go through any kind of ethical, uh, hospital ethical committees for this, so we just do the sugar pill. And then um, I gave them a little talk about something totally different, and then after, we asked them whether or not they thought that the sugar pill had worked. And about 40% of them said that they thought that it worked dramatically, that their cold symptoms got better. Well, of course, we had kept the tape player going all the time. So we had the data. We had the coughing and the sneezing and everything on the tape, on record, which was exactly identical before and after, objectively. But subjectively, their mind made them think that they were coughing less and sneezing less, and of course they also felt better, but they weren't better. Thank you, Professor Schwartz. The next question is for Andre Sen. Andre, what makes homeopathy a better option than scientifically derived medication? Well, that's a great question because <clears throat> in homeopathy we're treating the whole person, and it's over the long term. So with conventional medication, you're looking for an effect on, the, on a certain physiological process. So you're targeting uh, symptoms, and then you produce more symptoms because of the drugs, so now you have to use more drugs. In homeopathy, we're not, we're not doing this. We're treating the whole person over the long term. As you're treating somebody, little Johnny, with an ear infection at seven years old or at three years old, by treating John, little Johnny with homeopathy, the ear infection goes away, but also the susceptibility to get another infection changes, the susceptibility to be sick changes. So this is the best prophylactic. In other ways, by treating patient, people with homeopathy from a young age, you, you provide them with better health later on because the susceptibility to be sick is dealt with as soon as there is problem uh, occurring during life. So treating the whole person without the side effect of medication and uh, the medication typically in conventional medicine are palliative. They have an effect for a certain time. In homeopathy, they're curative because the pr there's a prolonged reaction to the remedy that changes the susceptibility to be sick. It's an extraordinary phenomenon that uh, uh, we, have, we have access to. Unfortunately, it's not well known enough, but 
like I say, it is the future of medicine, there's no doubt. And you'll see Joey one day, you'll say, you were right, Andre. <laughs> okay, raising the specter of doubt. Okay, this next question is going to go to both of you. I'm, uh, and perhaps I'll start with Andre. But the, the question is, um, and there's several questions along this line. Uh, can you explain the mechanism of action of homeopathic remedies? Well, there's, there's uh, several uh, mechanisms of action that are potential. Not, nothing has been confirmed. So we know, for instance, like the, the nanoparticle have a physiological effect that is completely different than other form of uh, medication. There's, you just have to Google nano medicine to see the, the world that is opening there. It's extraordinary, the, the possibility there. So the, the mechanism of action is not so clear. It's, 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 uh, it's, we could say we're like a bit like with aspirin. Aspirin was used for many years, but on, only until 1971, nobody knew why it, th there was an effect, but people were using it. In 71, they find out it affects prostaglandin. Now we're about at that level because we have the tools now. Finally, we have the tools, the very refined uh, spectroscopy equipment to be able to see that the change are happening by serial dilution, not in the toilet. We're talking about ser serial uh, process of dilution and succussion. Uh, Rustam Roy at his uh, signature lab at Penn State University, Professor Emeritus, showed that the succussion produced 10 to 15,000 atmosphere of pressure, which is enormous on the molecule of water. And that permits a, a permanent change of the structure of water. So yes, there is a, a beginning of understanding of the mechanism of action. There's many paper by Iris Bell in, 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 uh, as one who published all the possible mechanism of action, but it's not actually right now proven. Thank you. Uh, and the question I'm going to ask Dr. Schwartz, similar question, but perhaps a slightly different twist. It, does a patient have to know that it's a placebo? Uh, sorry, re rephrase that. If the patient knows that they're getting a placebo, will they still have a placebo effect? The most recent studies show yes, yes. But I'm not an expert on this. Can we have uh, an expert weigh in on this for a minute? Would you wish to comment? Very briefly, we're running out of time, but if you can keep it brief, I would be very happy to have a... Sure. So it is... Um... So my name is Dr. Raz, and uh, placebo is one of my uh, expertise, and it's completely unnecessary uh, to know whether you receive a placebo in order to have an effect. And if you do know that you receive a placebo, you can still show a placebo effect. And as a matter of fact, sometimes when you know that you're getting a placebo, you will show a heightened um, a placebo effect. If I just may comment on one more thing as I listen you know, to this uh, debate, um, it's really fascinating for me to see particularly the interjections from, from the audience um, as, as you listen to what you know, people are saying. Um, and that's because as I listen to this, I can see that the only thing that we agreed on so far is where you know, Sam Hahnemann is, is buried, and that's in Paris. But, but, you know, <laughs> but you know, other than that, I, I, I feel that you know, there's like, you know, very little in terms of you know, what people are saying. And I have to say that to somebody who knows the literature, it's like science fiction versus reality. Now, it is true that we cannot predict the future. It is absolutely true. But we can't. You know, we just can't predict the future. OK, thank you. Dr. Raz. Uh, time for two more questions, each person. Andre, do you believe that homeopathic remedies should be taken above or before the use of conventional medicines? This is really a choice of an individual. The more a person is uh, informed, the, most, the more a person can make an informed ch choice. So I would suggest that you, uh, you study the, 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 the pot potentiality of homeopathy for your family, for your loved ones, see how it is. But if, it, if you do it, you have to do it accurately and precisely. So if you cannot do it yourself because you're, you don't want to take the time to study it, make sure you consult somebody that is professionally trained. And I can tell you, I assure you, because I've been in the field for uh, almost 40 years now, that there's very, very few people that call themselves homeopathic that actually have uh, reached a level of uh, mastery that is, uh, is, uh, is uh, worth uh, considering. Because it's a very difficult field to study. And we have no, we have no um, like here in Canada, we have no university teaching homeopathy. So it, it, people take, get course right and left, and we're not even sure which one got the right course. So, and uh, as Joe pointed out, there's people in the profession that say anything, and there's no uh, body to say that this is pure quackery, what you're saying. However, there are homeopaths out there that are very serious, that are very learned per people. It's very interesting also. In, uh, most homeopaths, let's say in Europe, in South America, are graduate of 
medical school, scientific medical school, and you'll notice that throughout the history of homeopathy, you will not see, if we consider that homeopathy is a belief system, that there's no erythic, almost none. There's Hearns, but Hearns cheated. He, he says he was a homeopath when he's never complete a course of homeopathy. But in, throughout the history, you have all these scientifically trained physicians that adopt homeopathy, but you don't see any people quitting. Once they are trained, they stay in it. They, they leave allopathy to go in homeopathy, but not the other way around. You don't see that happening. Why? Why they don't they A lot don't of money it? to be made. Can I ask, I, I'm going to ask a final question. <laughs> uh, on the topic of money, the final question to you, Dr. Schwartz. Um, there, the accusations that homeopaths may be invested in their own research, and the, some of these accusations have also been leveled against physicians and involvement with pharmaceutical companies. There have been a number of uh, comments from the audience about that. Would you like to comment on the possible Absol bias absolutely. of medicine I, uh, in the, the pharmaceutical industry? Of course there are biases. There, there, there was a uh, very big article, and a good article just yesterday in the Washington Post that addresses that whole issue, where they looked at uh, what happened with Abandia, the, the diabetes drug that had to be recalled, because indeed uh, there was an obvious conflict of interest uh, among the authors. It happens. As I told you, at the beginning, virtually everything in life works on the bell curve. Yeah, you have some rotten apples in, in, in every field. Uh, and you can pick at those. But what we want to look at the bulk of the evidence. You know, Andre asked, how come you know, that homeopathy is not taught in hospitals? Why is it not taught in hospitals? I think that's the question that we have to ask. There is no conspiracy on part of the scientific medical establishment to keep effective therapies away from people. I mean, th th that's such a, a, you know, a naive argument. You see it being made, especially on the web these days, all the time. You know, that, that uh, only natural remedies you know, really work and, and this awful establishment is trying to, to sweep these under the carpet so that they can sell their expensive and ineffective medications. It doesn't work like that. Doctors, real doc physicians, want to cure people. They're, they're not out to, to destroy humanity. When something works, they embrace it. I mean, you know, you, you think back to, to what happened with the helicobacter story, for example. You know, when, when Barry Marshall first introduced the idea that, that uh, uh, ulcers were caused by a bacterium, what did the scientific establishment say? He's crazy because we know what causes it. It's caused by stress, it's caused by hyperacidity. Are you crazy saying that, that antibiotics can cure ulcers? And then he did something, a very foolhardy thing. He took uh, a dose of bacteria and he cured himself with antibiotics. Within a year, so-called triple therapy with antibiotics was used around the world. It was embraced because it worked and it was clear. If the same thing could be said for homeopathy, it would be embraced. Physicians would love not to have to intervene with drugs that do have all kinds of side effects if the kind, gentle therapy really worked. They're not out there to fool people. They're not out there to steal people's money. They would be happy if everything worked the way that you say. But the evidence just isn't there. If it were, it would be embraced. Read Thank you, lips. Dr. Schwartz. I'm going to ask Andre to, re to respond to that. You have two minutes, and then we're going to start to wrap up the session of the evening. Okay, Andre, read, you can respond to that. Okay, read my lips. It will be confirmed. In other words, homeopathy will become the, 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 the main way of treatment. Like hopefully in our lifetime. Hopefully in our, in our lifetime. If you remember Toe Blake, who was you, the coach of the Canadians, one of the best coaches ever, when he was asked to predict what would happen in the Stanley Cup series with the Maple Leafs one year, he said, predictions are for gypsies. So I'm not going to predict the future. I'm not going to say which way homeopathy will go. But if I were a betting man, I'm betting on science. And I'm going to venture that the same tired old arguments are going to persist and that homeopathy is not going to make any headway. But well, actually, I would say, I would say the following. Homeopathy has had difficulty to be recognized in scientific quarters, especially because of the remedy that are in ultra-molecular uh, delusion. However, now that we have the tools to study these, these uh, remedies, uh, it, there will be more and more interest, and it will, it will grow in a logarithmic way. Now, the interest will build up, and it will be used more. When you say that homeopathy is not used in hospital, it's wrong, because in India, it's official medicine. It's official medicine in many other countries, such as Brazil, and it's, it's, it's taught in hospitals, it's taught in university, and they're practicing it. In India, there's 250 state college teaching 
um, medical college teaching homeopathy. No, it is. It's just here, we, it, it, it's not happening. In Montreal, we did have the Montreal General, uh, the Montreal Homeopathic Hospital, which still is on Marlowe Street there. But uh, there were hospitals, now there's none, but it will come back. The future has to be, it will happen because we're dealing with a truth, a real phenomena. It's up to you to study it, to look at it for your own benefit. I don't get any benefit if you, if you are interested in homeopathy and you, uh, you, it's, it, you use it for your loved one. It will be for you. It's, your, it's, it's a gift that nature has for you and it's up to you to, to take it or not. Whether you use it or not, nature doesn't care. Thank you very much, Andre. Ladies and gentlemen, as an educator, I'd like to ask one question before we close up the evening, and that is, please raise your hand if at any point during this evening you started to think a little differently either about homeopathy before or against it. If you've had any changes in the way you think about this subject, please raise your hand. I'm just curious to see whether we've reached out and made any changes. I, I, I hear from, from, the, from the front row that perhaps this hasn't made an impact. I hope that this evening has at least made you think a little bit about the nature of evidence, about the nature of scientific inquiry, about the nature of health, about the nature of the human and the healing profession. I'd like to ask you please to join me in thanking Professor Joe Schwartz. <laughs> and Andre Sen. He wins the applause meter. Joe Schwartz. Andre Sen. I think we've all won. Thank you very much for your time. And thank you also to Ilana Block for organizing this. Uh, please, a big thank you to Ilana for putting this all together. Have a very good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and be healthy. <laughs>